taking the time to join us today for the PLUS Group webinar series. Today's topic is Cracking the Physician Code. Please note that all lines will be muted during this webinar. If you would like to ask a question, please go to the question pane on your control panel and type it in. We will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. We will also be holding some polls during the webinar. This will assist us with addressing issues that are of interest. Please note that we are also recording this webinar. It will be sent to you along with the presentation in a follow-up email. You will also be able to view it at our website at www.plusgroupus.com. Now I'm honored to honor introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Vicki Rackner. Dr. Rackner has been helping clients build relationships with doctors for over a dec decade. She's a published author who has frequently been quoted in the national media. She is an expert in helping advisors understand the physician's market. We are very thrilled that she is here today to share her knowledge with you. I'm going to now turn this over to Dr. Ragnar. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you, all participants, for being here. It's very exciting to be able to share some information with the PLUS group about how to acquire more physician clients. So grab a pencil and paper. You're about to get a competitive edge here. I have to tell you that just last week, I got a call from somebody just like you. We had never met before. He was on the webinar. And he called me to say, thank you so much. You know that webinar that you gave? I'm calling it my $40,000 webinar. He said, said that he had made an appointment with a veterinarian. Things were going well. And then he started asking about retirement plans. And things kind of started going south. So he remembered something that I had said and changed the conversation and walked out with a $400,000 check. So small changes can make a big, big difference. And so I want to invite you to think about what small change could you implement as a result of being here today, either in the medical market or these ideas can be applied in any other market? Because I would really like to help you get better results. So let me, before this webinar, I talked to several people in a leadership position in the organization, and I ask them, you know, I have this opportunity. What questions do you have that I might be able to address on the webinar? And the answers reminded me of the scene from my son's toddler years. Now, he had a love affair with trucks. And one day, we came across this huge construction site. And he pointed his chubby little toddler finger in the direction of the dirt pile and said, touch trucks. And I said, sweetie, that would be great. But look, do you see that there's a fence all around the construction site? And do you see the sign on that locked gate? It says, do not enter. And he thought for a moment and suggested, take down sign. Well, trying to enter the medical market is much like trying to enter that locked construction site. It's a very difficult challenge, getting past the gatekeeper, getting to the physician to actually get the physician to make a choice is very difficult. So in today's session, what we're going to do is talk about strategies that will position you for success. Before we get started, though, if I might, I'd like to know just a little more about you. And hopefully, I've just launched a poll. And I'm wondering if you might be able to share with us why you're here today. Are you already working with doctor clients? And maybe you're like some of my coaching clients who says, boy, the old ways of doing business aren't working as well anymore, and I'd really like to learn some new techniques. Are you trying to decide to enter the medical market? Or um, you've made a commitment. And we have the poll findings here. About uh, a little over half of you have voted. But it looks like the majority of you are already working with doctor clients, and you just like to be able to do it a little better. And it looks like we've got about 20% who've made the commitment to enter the medical market, and you want to do it right. And then another 20% are trying to decide if the medical market is right for them. 
So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let me ask a second poll question. And that is this. What percentage of your practice do doctors constitute? Less than 20%, 20 to 50%, 50 to 80%? OK. And it looks like votes are still being tallied here. It looks like the majority probably has less than 20% of their clients in the medical market. All right, let me pose another question here. What percentage of your practice would you like to constitute doctor clients in a year from today? So in other words, you know, you're going to get some ideas today as you implement these ideas, as you decide where you want to take your practice. Where would you like to be in a year from now? And the votes are in. They're coming in. I so appreciate your, your willingness to participate in this. And it looks like people want to shift one step up. In other words, um, those who have less than 20% want to go to 20 to 50%. Um, and about 20% want to go from 50 to 80%, and about 20% want to get um, over 80%. Okay, and the last poll question here, what is the biggest challenge that you face when trying to acquire more doctor clients? So what is the number one problem that you'd like solved today in this course, in this session that we're having? OK. It looks like um, sort of a third. OK, so about a third of you say, well, gee, I can't get past the gatekeeper. A third say, can't get the doctor on the phone. A third say, I can't get the doctor to make a commitment, and about 20% say, can't get the doctor to give me referrals. All right, well, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about are actual strategies and tactics to help you achieve greater results in the medical market. Before I begin, I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about who I am and what my biases are. Here you see an operative note. This was my operative note. I was in my 20s in a graduate program when I fainted on my way to the bathroom. Um, many hours later, I was rushed to the operating room, and the wisdom of my body told me I was dying. When they got into the operating room, they discovered that I'd had an ovarian cyst that had ruptured over blood vessel, and about half of my blood volume was in my pelvis by the time they arrived there. I remember waking up in the recovery room so grateful that I was alive. And the very next thought was, I'm going to be a doctor and save other people's lives like my own had been saved. That's exactly what I did. Not surprisingly, I became a surgeon. I was in private practice here in Seattle. I served as a clinical faculty at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And once I had settled in, I decided it's time to start my family. I was blessed to become pregnant when I was 40 years old. I had a plan. I was going to convert one of my exam rooms to a nursery. My office manager was going to take care of my child while I practiced. And that's exactly what I did. But things didn't quite go as I expected. As my son grew, it became pretty obvious that he was different than the other children. And I tried to ignore the comments that I had gotten. Oh, he's not rolling over yet. He's not doing these things yet. And finally, finally, when his first birthday rolled around and he wasn't speaking, I decided to push my pediatrician for a formal evaluation. And I remember the day that I went in to find out the results woman said, you know, Vicki, you've already noticed that your child is behind in his language development. And what I need to tell you is that he is behind in all of the areas that we measured. And we are going to recommend that your son be admitted to our special state-funded school 
to help him achieve his developmental landmarks. Well, I was just devastated. I had operated my whole pregnancy. I had been exposed to anesthetic gases and fluoroscopy. I thought, what have I done to my son? So I took a leave of absence to dedicate myself to being a full-time mom and do everything in my powers to give my son the best chance at life. I threw myself in. I redefined what health was because in my surgeon's mind, health was an absence of disease. And really, I was trying to fix my son. But what if I couldn't fix my son? And I just shifted around what it meant to be healthy. I decided that health wasn't being perfect. It was about being perfectly you in top functioning condition. I had an idea of who my son was, who I wanted him to be, and I needed to release that and just help him be most fully the person who he was. Magic happened when I did that. I'm pleased to report that after he was there for a year, he was retested and booted out of the school because he met his developmental landmarks. He's now a wonderful 15-year-old vibrant son. And my main problem with him is that he's so much smarter than I am. He's got his own brain that operates in his own way. But you would never guess that we had this rocky start. Well, after this whole process was done, I took a deep breath. And I thought, you know what? I've had some pretty unique experiences. I've been a patient facing a life-threatening medical condition. I've been the doctor helping people through these medical conditions. I've been the family caregiver. And what I really knew is each of these people really had a different way of looking at the world. In the meanwhile, I had been supporting myself by reviewing medical malpractice lawsuits. And I had this insight that perhaps one of the reasons there were these problems is that various stakeholders in the healthcare system really didn't understand the perspective of another. And I thought, what if I could create some kind of consulting business to help everyone get on the same page at the same time? So in 2000, I left clinical practice and launched my consulting business, Medical Bridges. And it was intended to be the bridge to doctors. Well, what I didn't really understand was how hard it was going to be and how little I, as a doctor, knew about running business. So in the same way that patients and doctors see medical situations from different perspectives, what I discovered is that the mind of the doctor and the mind of a business person work differently. So I dedicated myself to really understanding how business people think. And once I figured that out, once I cracked that code, I was able to achieve much different results. So. One of the challenges that you as a financial advisor face, I think probably without even knowing it, is that it's really common when you see the world in a certain way to project that perception onto the others. And I'm here today to tell you that doctors see the world differently than you do. And what I'd like to do is sort of help you cross this bridge that I built so that you can leave the land of medicine, enter the land of business, and really be able to engage physicians. And when I think about this process, what I think about is taking my laptop over to Europe. Now, my laptop needs to be charged. And if I don't bring a special plug to accommodate the difference in wiring in Europe, I can't do it. No matter how hard I try to plug my laptop into the wall, it's just not going to work. You need that adapter. So think of the kind of information that you're getting today, this bridge information, as the adapter that will enable you to engage physicians, to plug into them so that you can acquire them as clients. So what I've done is I've cherry-picked some basic concepts from my, my course that I call Cracking the Physician Code Course. It's basically an eight-module algorithm that walks financial advisors through the process of starting with absolutely no physician clients or doctor clients and building a physician-friendly practice. So let me begin. What makes the physician niche attractive? Here are the three top reasons. 
According to the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics, nine out of the ten highest paid occupations in the United States are some form of doctors. And by the way, the difference between the word doctor and physician is that physicians are a special kind of doctor. They're the kinds of doctors that have MD or DO after their name. And they're at the top of the earning rung. But other people that are on the top of this list include dentists, orthodontists, um, podiatrists, optometrists, and then there are ancillary healthcare professionals like nurse anesthetists and pharmacists, some of which actually generate a higher revenue than physicians do. Um, this is a survey um, from survey.com, and by the way, I will be happy to send you a PDF of these slides so you don't have to worry about it. Reason number two it's really great to work with doctor clients is they are loyal like dogs. Once you develop a physician client, you pretty much have them for life. And that's feature number three is the propensity of doctors to talk about you so that you can build a referral-based business. If you could only be a fly on the wall of the surgeon's lounge or the doctor's dining room, what you would discover is doctors asking other doctors for resources and sharing those resources. I found out the name of every single one of my advisors, including my disability agent, in the surgeon's lounge. So once you develop yourself, in the doctor niche, it's very, very easy to build a referral network. And that's important for you because you've already pointed out that it's very difficult to build those first relationships with physicians. Once you have that, you want to leverage that. That's going to help you with your exponential practice growth. Now, this is also a great time to be focusing on the medical market and why it's that physicians have a lot of financial pain right now. They've just gotten a huge financial wake-up call and it takes the form of rising taxes, looming fee cuts while the cost of business continue to rise. There's speculation that the Medicare fee schedule for physicians may be cut by as much as one-third within the next couple of years. Physicians face an uncertain economic recovery that's going to fuel their retirement. Today, 40% of practicing physicians are age 55 or older. This is a pressing concern for them. And finally, there are huge concerns about what the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is really going to mean for them. Now, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly how things are going to unfold, but let me base the Affordable Care Act, let me position it in a historic context. So if you look at the history of healthcare delivery, you can divide it into roughly four phases. The first is the pre-penicillin era. So penicillin really was distributed during the Second World War. I had a relative, a distant relative, who was born in 1901, and he was a family doctor. He practiced in this gracious old home in Minneapolis where I grew up. He um, married his nurse, and they practiced and lived in this gracious old house. Um, my distant cousin charged what he thought were reasonable fees. Patients paid out of their pocket. When patients couldn't pay, they used to barter with him. He talked about practicing during the Great Depression, and he would exchange medical services for snow shoveling or some chickens. But the truth was, the medical care costs really weren't that high because what my cousin could do for patients really was not that great. I mean, he basically could just be with patients when bad things happened. When penicillin came to be, suddenly it was a very new change. And he talked about the blues being the heroes. Blue Cross and Blue Shield finally offered his patients the security that a medical illness would not bankrupt him. Well, the next generation, the generation of my uncles, um, were in training around the time that JFK was president. And they faced a different future. Like the first generation, they planned on going into practice for themselves. But their practice was in, a, in an office suite right next to the hospital. Virtually all of their patients were insured. But like my distant cousin, they too decided how much they would charge since 
it to the insurance company, and the insurance company paid. Well, I went to medical school in the 80s, and like the generations before me, I expected to go into this, um, this private practice. About 80% of doctors went there. But unlike them, I went into a group practice. Then in the 90s, things changed. Healthcare costs were exploding. Technology was exploding. And the insurance company said, we have to do something about this. We will not just simply stand by and watch healthcare costs soar. We are going to try to manage care costs with a program called Managed Care. Well, one of my colleagues said, this is like inviting a clown into the operating room with us. Essentially what happened is that the helm of the healthcare system was arrested from the doctor and given to the insurance company. Doctors used to call the shots. Insurance companies were now calling the shots. Hospitals and clinics approached doctors and said, look, this is a big, bad change. We are here to help you. Why don't you sell your practices to us? And we will um, take care of the business of medicine. You can get higher fees from the insurance company, and you can just focus on patient care. And many physicians did sell. In fact, the number of physicians who held an ownership stake in the practice by 2000 had dropped to about 50%. What doctors quickly discovered is that the, in, the hospitals and clinics were not really in their corner protecting them, looking out for their best interests. Many physicians were unhappy. And if you were in the disability insurance industry at that time, you know the huge number of doctors who left on disability leave. Well, those of us who are boomers are expecting that the Affordable Care Act is going to look like managed care on steroids. We are expecting that the same kind of cycles that we saw during managed care will repeat themselves. We're currently seeing sales of practices to hospitals and clinics again. And it's estimated that within a couple of years, only one in three doctors will hold an ownership stake in the practice. We're expecting that there will be more disability claims, just as there were in managed care. And these boomers who've already gone through managed care are probably going to be looking at an early retirement. So the biggest trends that we're seeing now are doctors selling practices. We're seeing doctors who are interested in new revenue sources. After all, if your paycheck were cut in a third, by a third, you'd probably want to figure out ways of securing your revenue. And we're seeing physicians who are more and more interested in retirement planning. Well, you think, gee, there's this huge market. This is the right time. Why is it so hard to engage physicians? And as I talk with my coaching clients, I hear things like, well, gee, I just can't get kept past the gatekeeper, or doctors are too busy and too distracted, or gee, they'll never leave their brother-in-law who's a financial advisor. I'll never be able to make it. Well, unfortunately, I've got some more challenging news, which is all of those things are about to get worse. Part of the Affordable Care Act legislation is this little piece of legislation called the Sunshine Act. It's intended to help physicians prescribe responsibly by limiting the activity of the pharmaceutical reps. So the Sunshine Act says that if the doctor accepts any gift from a medical device company or a pharmaceutical company of greater than $10, it needs to be publicly reported. And the reason I'm mentioning this to you is that hospitals and clinics and medical practices want to avoid being named. So they're clamping down on the calls that can get through. In other words, the gates are getting even tighter. And you will be collateral damage. So it's going to be even harder for you to get through. So we need a new way of conducting business. I work with medical advisors who are the top advisors to physicians, as described by the publication Medical Economics. They are finding that the old ways of conducting business aren't working as well anymore. So it's time to step back and take a fresh view. And in order to achieve success in the medical market, it's important to understand the customs in the world of medicine what drives physicians' behavior, or anyone's behavior for that matter, and 
specifically for you what physicians' relationship with money is all about. So let me tell you what you need to know about doctors. First, they answer a call to medical service. They put patients first. Now, business people are interested in optimizing profits. Doctors are interested in optimizing the number of people that they serve. They want to carve their legacy. They engage in a lengthy training process. Four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school. As a general surgeon, I did five years of general surgery residency. If I w became a cardiac surgeon, that would be three more years. So on average, by the time that doctors finally start their real first job, they're in their mid to late 30s. The skills and temperaments that they need to get through medical school and deliver the kind of care that you want for yourself or your family also makes them challenging prospects and clients. So if your dad had to have an angioplasty, you'd want that cardiologist right there completely with your dad, ignoring phone calls and distractions. However, if you want to acquire that same cardiologist as a client, that is a liability for you. So here is something really important. The single most influential person in a physician's life is a mentor or a senior colleague. So when I hear advisors want to know, you know, how do I get past the gatekeeper? How do I actually get a doctor on the phone? I always want to invite them to think about how can you get the people who already know you and like you and trust you to pass your name along so it's not you who's trying to build the relationship, but rather it's you adding a link in the chain of trust. The last thing to remember is that even though doctors are unlike the general population in many ways, in many ways they're just the same. Oprah said that she's interviewed over 40,000 people, and what comes right down to it, everyone wants the same thing. They want to know, do you think what's important to me is important to you? Do you hear me? Do you see me? And physicians, in general, are lonely people. There are very few people in their trusted circles. And as a financial advisor, you become one of those trusted people. So you become a, an inner circle member. Now, what's the biggest surprise to advisors as they enter the medical market? It's that for physicians, money is the ultimate taboo topic. So imagine being at home at night. Some stranger calls you and says, I'd like to talk to you about your sexuality. It just seems too much. That's a taboo topic. You've got to develop trust before you build that relationship. Well, for doctors, talking about money is exactly the same way. I love watching Shark Tank, and I love watching Mr. Wonderful talk about his relationship with money, how much he loves money. You know, Barbara talked about how much she likes the smell of money. You would never hear physicians talking about money like that. In some ways, money is kind of shameful. There's something about it that we don't really like. A psychiatrist friend of mine said that one of her very troubled patients had approached her and said, do you know that you doctors get rich off of the suffering of others? So what are the factors that shape physicians' financial lives? Well, the first is the culture of medicine. You know, in the government, we have the separation of church and state. In the world of medicine, we have the separation between the care a patient gets and the patient's ability to pay. So we just don't mix the two conversations. Further, physicians are so busy learning everything they need to know about giving patients good information that they don't have a lot of time to learn about finances. And being smart and knowing about money are two different things. I remember when I was about to start my practice, and I had this thought, well, gee, maybe I should know something about business. One of my surgical mentors said, hey, you know how to manage a checkbook, don't you? You can run a medical practice, no problem. So physicians don't even know how much they don't know about finances. And further, they are highly aware on some level that they are very vulnerable. Everyone wants to work with the rich doctors. They are getting pitches all the time. And on some level, they know that they don't know. And so they need to develop trust before they're willing to go on to conversations about money. So how do they manage money? Three techniques. There's benign neglect. Hey, I'm a doctor. There's always going to be enough money. Don't need to worry about it. There's the do-it-yourselfer. This is the person who might be looking at the white coat investor or maybe getting advice from 
colleagues, or there's the delegator, somebody who decides that they're going to delegate this job to somebody else so that they can just pay attention to patient care. Maybe that somebody else is the wife or the husband. Maybe it's the office manager. Maybe it's a financial advisor. Only about half of physicians work with a formal financial advisor. And sometimes their wrong choice comes back to bite them. I had a colleague who had her entire retirement embezzled by her office manager. It was gone by the time she figured this one out. What's the biggest secret to working with doctors? If you want to conduct business with doctors, conduct yourself as one. You already know that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And now neuroscience explains why. Our brains are wired with a special cell called a mirror neuron. So the statement, I like you, really means I'm like you. I see part of myself reflected in you. So if you want to build rapport quickly, you activate these mirror neurons. And the good news for you is that doctors and financial advisors basically do the same job. They manage risk in the face of an uncertain future when the stakes are high. So it's very easy for you to conduct yourself as a doctor. And here's the biggest key to success. Physicians manage their wealth as patients manage their health. So if you think about the last time that you were a patient in the doctor's office, imagine yourself in a town. The doctor comes in, and it's nerve-wracking being there. You're probably scared. On average, patients retain about 30% of what doctors say. So now imagine switching positions. Imagine putting on the white coat, and imagine having the doctor in the patient gown. Well, this is exactly how doctors manage their money. This is outside of their day-to-day -day experience. They're scared. They often don't listen very well. And they count on you to offer leadership. So the most important thing to remember from this whole presentation is that emotion drives motion. As an advisor, you are trained to stay in your thinking brain. And I bet that you assume smart people are also functioning from their thinking brain. But I'm here to tell you that physicians manage their finances with their feeling brain, with their emotional brain. So when you make connections with their emotional brain, you can help them elevate to their thinking brain. So you need to connect with their emotional system. OK, so how do you put this together and actually build a physician-friendly practice. Well, let's take a lesson from John D. Rockefeller. As you know, he made his first fortune refining oil to kerosene. The kerosene lit the country. Well, he saw that a big part of his expense was transportation, getting his message to the marketplace. So he decided, well, what if I invest in building a pipeline? That would mean higher profitability. And in fact, it does cost you some money to get your message to the prospects and clients you want to acquire. So what we want to do is build a pipeline that's going to support exponential growth. And then we want to keep in mind his second lesson, which is waste not. When he got his pipeline built, that was just about the time that electricity came to be widely accepted, which meant that the kerosene would no longer have a market. So he went back to his refineries and said, what can I do? And the people said, well, you know, we've got this vapor, this volatile vapor that can burst into flames. So we just divert it and pour it into the river stream. And that volatile product was gas. And what Rockefeller did was he found a way of using this waste product. And that is some, those are all lessons that we can incorporate as we figure out how to build the infrastructure for exponential growth and really position you for success as the medical market shifts. So what I'd like to share with you is the basic outline of this BDD blueprint, this blueprint about how to conduct business with doctors. You already know about a B2B business model and a B2C business model. I think that the B2D business model is slightly different because it accommodates this different relationship that doctors have with money, which after all is the core of your value proposition. So. What I'd like to do is, I'm just skipping through these slides um, in the interest of time. OK, so let's talk about the six steps very quickly. Step number one is focus. Don't try to be all things to all doctors. Choose your best fit client. 
I've studied the difference between hobbyists and high performers, the people who really get an ROI on their investments in their practice, and the people who tinker in the medical market. The major difference is this focus. And I've come to believe that focus contributes to high performance and accelerated growth in the medical market. So you want to strategically choose the clients you work with. And let's just focus on disability. Let's say that you wanted to really promote um, more clients for your asset protection products. Well, a must-read report is the 2013 report on U.S. Physician Financial Preparedness conducted by the AMA Insurance Agency. The big headline, the big result that they had was that only 6% of physicians considered themselves ahead of where they'd like to be in retirement planning. About half said that they were on track and half said that they were behind where they'd like to be. Well, there are some specific questions about disability insurance, and let me just share these with you very, very quickly. Most physicians purchased a disability insurance policy early on in their career or shortly after starting their practice. So maybe your focus is either residents, people in training, or doctors who are just starting their practice. So maybe that's your focus. Some other key findings, let me just skip over again in the interest of time. So another key point, 42% of respondents haven't reviewed their disability insurance policies within the past five years. One of the leaders in the PLUS group was kind enough to spend some time on the phone yesterday telling me about what happens with agents who sell disability insurance. He said many of them come and go. So physicians kind of find themselves as a disability orphan. The person who first sold them the policy isn't there anymore. Is there a strategy where you could connect with those doctors and see if you can offer value to them? Maybe that's your target. Um, many physicians don't know whether their protection is adequate. Is there some way that you can solve this problem for them and help answer the question? So um, just want to let you know that you are welcome to contact your PLUS group office. And they will be happy to send you the link to the special report. Plus, I've also made a video about 10 ways that you can leverage this report as a marketing tool. Step number two is research, gather intelligence. There's a place in Washington where hundreds of eagles gather at a certain riverbank. Why? It's because the spawning salmon come lay their eggs, and then die. So the eagles know that if they show up at the right place at the right time, they will have a feast. High performance in the medical market do the same thing. They know how to be in the right place at the right time with the right message. And it starts with the willingness to just step back and ask some questions. One thing that's very important for you to know is that July 1st is a red letter day in the medical community. Virtually all physicians who begin new practices or new positions do so July 1st. And as you know, people are most likely to purchase asset protection products at times of new beginnings. So right now, we're in a window of opportunity. This is maximum marketing time for disability products. Step number three is groom for engagement. Remember the story of Cinderella? Cinderella wanted to go to the ball, but she wasn't dressed appropriately. The fairy godmother came in with a sweep of the magic wand, helped Cinderella transform into somebody who would fit in at the ball and stand out for the right reason. Successful financial advisors do the same thing. I learned this lesson the hard way with my $40,000 mistake. As a physician, I knew that patients needed a certain product. I decided to solve this problem by creating it. I got lots of positive feedback. When I was the co-author of this book on heart disease, I had this aha moment. What if I created some kind of journal so patients could keep their own version of their stories so that they would know what's going on with their bodies? I invested in this product. I, I promoted it with radio tours and made not one sale. My mistake was that I was delivering something that people needed but didn't want. And in many senses, this is the challenge that you face too. You deliver what prospects need. But in order to engage them and build a relationship, 
It means delivering what they want. Further, you can increase your medical magnetism by optimizing your chance of making that happen. So if you've ever played with magnets, what you know is that depending on the orientation of the magnet, magnets will either attract or repel each other. So the thing that will attract clients to you in the business community might be the very same thing that repel clients in the medical community. So just want to let you know that I have a special report, How to Optimize Your Medical Magnetism and Engage More Physician Prospects and Clients. Feel welcome to contact your PLUS group office, and they will give you the link for this special report. Step number four in the BVD Blueprint is generate leads. Add links in the chain of trust. Probably the number one experts in marketing to physicians are the pharmaceutical industry. They invest in things that work. They spend more money in marketing research than in R&D for their pharmaceutical sales products. In a sense, you could say that their major product is marketing to physicians. They know some stuff. How can we tap into the lessons of what they know to help you successfully engage physicians? Well, let's just take a look at some of the things that they do. They give away lots of free samples. You can give away free samples of things, too. Maybe you want to do a survey or some kind of assessment tool. They bring their message direct to consumers, so the consumers will influence the doctors. Well, how about bringing your message to the husbands or wives of the doctors? Or the den mother at the hospital, the person that the doctor turns to when they want a problem solved. They host speaker events. They bring in doctors to deliver educational content. Could you do that? Could you invite some of your doctor clients or industry leaders in to deliver talks? Could you engage in some kind of social media campaign? More and more physicians are on social media. Uh, right now, it's just the early adapters. But it, as things develop, I expect that quickly doctors are going to have a presence on social media. Which one, I don't know. But can you leverage that? Can you somehow find the key influence leaders, the gray-haired doctors in the community who influence other doctors? I've got one client who works with this gray hair neuro-ophthalmologist. Whatever this guy says is golden. Brian tells me that this guy has sent him about 20 clients. He just looks at a doctor and says, you've got to see Brian. And those doctors go and see Brian. So step number six is generate referrals. Get doctors talking about you. This is where the real gold is. So when I talk about asking for referrals, I'm not talking about the conventional thing of, can you give me three names, please? I'm talking about inviting doctors into a conspiracy of service. After all, you are there to serve doctors. Doctors care about other doctors. How can you invite them into this conspiracy? So we go through this referral toolkit. So the speed at which referral-based practice grows is driven by your ability to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time, the strength of the tribal affiliation. So once you identify this group of people with whom you work, this tribe, how affiliated are they? And your perceived value, your ability to articulate your value in terms that attracts doctors, that gives them what they want. And then finally, success is contingent on your ability to create and execute a plan. As I work with clients, what I've discovered is what's really important is that you do this in a way that works for you. You have your own unique gifts and talents and passions. And I'm kind of like a matchmaker who helps people understand who they are and find good fits and find ways of building businesses in a way that works for you. Because the way to physical health or business health is to be who you are, know what you know, and do what you need to do. So before I go on, how about if we open this for questions? Any questions or comments here? You need to type them in on the right side. There's an area that says questions, and you can just type it in. And uh, Dr. Rackman will be able to see them. This went very, very quickly. Um, 
it went very quickly. I wish that I could just do a Vulcan mind meld and just download everything that I know to all the participants on the line. Um, but really what I've been talking about is a new paradigm. It's a new way of interacting with doctors so that you invite them there to you. Okay. How do you, okay. How do you recommend getting in front of doctors if you can't talk to them in the hospital? So the answer to that question is, after you've identified the group of doctors with whom you want to work, you talk with them and find out what they'd like. You know, one way of positioning yourself is saying, you know, I'm a financial advisor or I'm somebody who sells disability insurance. But you could also position yourself as, I am somebody who helps physicians thrive no matter what. Because after all, that's what asset protection really is. Well, maybe what you do is you deliver some kind of minor solution that helps doctors do that. I've written an ebook about how doctors can acquire more patients. Every doctor, even hospital employees, want to get more patients. So maybe what you could do instead of cold calling is you could just deliver this free ebook, or you could deliver some ideas about how doctors could generate more revenue. So in other words, offer them a little hostess gift, offer them a little something, and then let them know that there's more. You build trust when you do that, and that makes it more likely that they're going to want to take the next step. I'll also tell you that no gatekeeper is going to keep anything that has intrinsic value from the doctors. That's going to get through. So you can offer to send a link. You can send something physical. You can invite them to an educational event. So you just take the first step. And then, and, and then through that first step, you take the next small step. So it might mean that there's six small steps before you actually get to talking about disability insurance. OK, let me see. Um, you didn't share any techniques to get past the gatekeeper. Um, thank you for that comment, Warren. And what I'm suggesting to you is that you might want to try a different strategy, because getting past the gatekeeper in the conventional way you know, saying, I'd like to talk about the doctor. This is a financial matter. That's going to get more and more challenging. That's a very low ROI effort. A much higher ROI effort is to deliver these value delivery vehicles, these little hostess gifts. Deliver value and give physicians a little taste of the kind of experience that they can help for you. In the long run, that is going to be a much more effective, higher ROI way of doing things. Remember I told you about this $400,000 idea at the very beginning of the call? What that advisor figured out was that he was going to the money conversation way too soon. He stepped back and engaged with the doctor's emotional brain by saying, hey, why did you become a veterinarian? What do you like about being a veterinarian? What are some of your success stories? And in that way, he built rapport to be able to transcend up into the thinking brain. Um, let me see. JD, if you don't know anyone in the medical market, where would you start to try and get into the market? Thank you, JD, for that question. I love it. OK, so here is my suggestion for you. Everyone knows doctors. Everyone knows that this is a challenging time for doctors. What you can say to them, the people who already know you and like you and trust you, is say, I am interested in serving the doctors who serve our community. If you know any doctors who would like to get this kind of result, please have them contact me and get this special free yummy treat. So let's say, for example, you wanted to work with doctors who are just out of residency, who are you know, establishing themselves in practice. You can go to the people who already know you, like you, and trust you, including your existing clients, including your college classmates, including your banker and your nail salon person, and say, hey, look, I'm interested in helping doctors who are fresh out of residency, who are just getting oriented. If you know any of these doctors who would like some ideas about you know, how to have summer fun or what restaurants to go to, 
or how to get more patients, have them contact me because I have some free resources for them. I want to help them thrive. And when they contact you, you give them the free resource and then get permission to take the next step for doctors to accept your next free gift. So what that means is that you have a series of free goodies, things that are kind of like the free samples that you give away at the grocery store. The pharmaceutical sales reps know that on average, it takes about six contacts with doctors before they actually finally change their behaviors. So I hope that that answers your question. Um, and by the way, I'm happy to stay on the line as long as you want. Um, next, how do we get to, in to see the doctor? OK, so those eagles didn't go chasing after the salmon. The eagles went to where the salmon gathered. And in general, that's the best strategy for you. So doctors do really gather on a regular basis. They're active in associations. They might be active in social media. So a very effective strategy is to go where they're already gathering. You know, I, have, I work with a financial advisor who makes a seven-figure income selling disability policies to residents. What she's done is she's built a relationship with the residency educational director and on a quarterly basis goes in and gives talks that doctors want to hear about. It's not necessarily about disability insurance. It's all sorts of things related to financial literacy, how to raise financially literate children, how to talk to patients about money. So it's about money and business development. And because she builds those relationships, she's able to sell policies. And the beauty of this is that it's a renewable resource of leads. Every year, there's a new crop of residents. So this has been a great strategy. So doctors attend meetings. They, um, they read certain publications. If you can figure out where your target vertical market gathers, just like the eagle knows where the salmon gather, you can plan to be there. It's a much, much more effective way of accelerating your practice growth. Um, so thank you for that question. Colin says, I love the idea for referrals. What's the language you use to demonstrate exclusivity um, to their colleagues? So what you do is instead of asking for the big sale, hey, do you know any doctor who wants to review their disability policy and make sure it's you know, really adequate? I'd start with a much smaller yes. Like you know, when my son was on Little League, the coach always used to say to him, don't try to hit the home run. Just get on base. So just get on base with doctors. So you can say to your existing clients and your friends and relatives, people who already know you, like you, trust you, hey, I've got this special event. I'm bringing in a speaker to help doctors figure out how to treat patients so they thank you rather than sue you. You are welcome to invite your friends there. And then when the physician goes there, you can close to the next step, which is get on my mailing list. or you know, sign up for my next free product. So one of, the, one of the concerns that doctors have these days in referring their colleagues to a financial advisor is they don't want to take responsibility in case, you know, God forbid somebody's the next Bernie Madoff because there have been doctors who have been burned like that. Doctors make notoriously bad choices. In fact, one of my advisors says that her main job is protecting her doctors from DDDs, dumb doctor deals. So don't, don't ask for the home run. Just get on base. And then it's not your referral physician's responsibility about what happens next. It's your responsibility and their colleague. Hope that answers your question. How do we get residents to an event? Um, the answer is always give them what they want. You know, a lot of times when I think about marketing to doctors, I think about trying to get my son to eat his vegetables. You know, they were good for him. But if it's distasteful for him, he's not going to eat it. And I want to avoid that power struggle. So what I used to do is I used to sneak the nutritious things into dishes that he wanted. And that's exactly the strategy that works for high-performing financial advisors, too. Find out what they want, deliver the value to them, and build a relationship so you can take the next step. So thank you for that question, Sandra. What about the role of medical business management consultants as a source of physicians and clients? Great question. Thank you for asking, Scott. There are, in fact, associations, the medical group managers associations, that can be strategic partners. So just be aware of this. There are two kinds of people in the world. 
There are the kind of people who want to find a way of saying yes. There's a kind of person who wants to find a way of saying no. And um, the medical consultant or the um, manager of the office can be either one. So you want to figure out which it is. You want to spend more time with people who are interested in saying yes, and less time with people who are interested in saying no. In fact, eschew them. Stay away from them. And in general, um, HR people seem like a logical way of making contact. Uh -uh. Generally, those are the people who want to say no. So there are much better ways of doing it. You know, one of my advisors who actually sells disability insurance full time, he approached me and he said, hey, listen, somebody's offering to sell me leads. Should I, should I purchase it? And in general, I think that's a bad idea because you can't purchase relationships. I said, OK, well, before, we, before I answer that, tell me a little bit about what you did before you sold disability insurance. He said, well, um, I used to work for Merck. I said, really? And he's, I said, well, do you have any doctors in the family? Oh, yeah, I've got a cousin. And in fact, my daughter's thinking about going to medical school. And I said, well, are you still in touch with the doctors that you used to see? Oh, yeah, I stayed in contact with them. So here he was with this rich source of referrals right in his backyard. And he had overlooked them. So you want to think about strategic relationships that you already have, because Everyone knows a doctor, either um, their own doctor, and their own doctor, by the way, might be thinking about maybe shutting down the practice. So some value that you deliver might be helpful. Or people, high net worth people have doctors in their social circles and families. So begin where you are. Mine your, your treasures that you've already developed. OK, how do I get more information on the details of cracking the Dr. Code course? Thank you for asking that question. Um, you are welcome to go to www.targetingdoctors.com. And there is a course section. And I'll tell you, it would be my great honor if you could participate. You see, I'm on a mission to alleviate financial pain and suffering, and you are the financial doctors. So I know that when you are empowered with the right tools, you are going to lead to our economic recovery. I don't think it's going to come from the top down with policy changes. I think it's going to start from the ground up with you working with an individual client, restoring their financial health, and then sending out ripples in the community. And when you can help a physician to financial health, they are in a powerful position to fuel the recovery of a community. So it would be my great honor to work with you. I really appreciate the PLUS group bringing me in and offering this educational content. And I want to honor them by offering you a 30% discount on anything that you find on my site, whether it's a course, whether it's the home study course, or the web-based interactive course, or done for you marketing. I've got weekly videos. 30% discount on all of those. Just want to let you know that please take advantage of them real soon. <clears throat> I just launched this home study course, and the price is going to go up after Labor Day. So really get the most value that you can by taking a look at that home study course or the, the current um, web-based interactive courses. You can find all of those on the line. Um, next question is, um, and I'm sorry if I'm missing yours, if I'm you skipping yours. The office manager is the next one. OK. Let me scroll down here through. Um, Dan Blackstone. OK, Dan. Um, you know, I'm going to start from the bottom up, and, and okay. I, I'm sorry. OK, you mentioned disability insurance several times. Are doctors significantly more receptive to one product type over another? Um, uh, no, they are not. But I just started thinking about disability and other asset protection products because I just know how much doctors need them. Um, you probably know the story of doctors who are not able to continue in their practice. So it's something that I feel passionately about. Life insurance, 
other forms of asset protection are very, very important too. And by the way, when we're talking about asset protection, I was just recently um, on a trip. I rented a car, and I started thinking, I wonder how many doctors have adequate protection against just the life stuff that happened. Like, do they buy enough insurance for their rental car? Do they know that they should be buying an errors and omissions policy to cover any claims that would arise from their social media presence? So um, asset protection, the, the whole package, all of it is important. Who is more likely to get a doctor to take an appointment with me? So what you want to do is you want another doctor to do it. So you want to get the doctors in the surgeon's lounge in the doctor's dining room talking about you. Because there's going to be doctors like me who are there asking, hey, who should I talk to about life insurance? Who should I talk to about disability or medical malpractice? And that is the most effective way of making a sale. If you, you might be familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Purple Cow, excellent book. I recommend reading it. Offer some kind of purple cow and get doctors talking about you. That is your most effective way of marketing. If you can, get testimonials from doctors. Get doctors talking about you either in writing or in video. Uh, what a doctor thinks about you is the most effective marketing tool that you have. So thank you for asking that question, Christopher. I hope that I asked, answered your questions. What do you do when you have turned off some doctor prospects by getting into the money conversation too soon? How do you step back and recover? Doctors are very forgiving people. And what you might want to do is just go back to them and say, you know what? I just really wanted to apologize. I'm so used to dealing with business people. And you know, we talk about money. We're driven by um, you know, the, the profit motive. We're capitalists. And I now understand that really the world of medicine is very different. What I'd love to do with you is really talk about what's important to you, not what's important to me. Let's talk about how you can serve more effectively and create a legacy. And just try to step back. Um, they might say no. I mean, you, you might have lost them, but it's also possible that you might be able to build an even stronger relationship by going back and offering an apology and really letting them know that you get them, that you understand what's important to them. Uh, so I hope that answered your question, David. Colin, let's see. Marketing to house staff. From your training experience, how influential are the GME office residency coordinators? Or are we better off going straight to the source? OK, so here's the deal. Unfortunately, um, this den mother person doesn't always wear the same hat. Like the den mother at your medical facility might be the janitor or the person who's the cashier in the cafeteria, and I mean that quite literally. So what you want to find out is who is the go-to person? Who is the person that doctors go to when they want a problem solved? That's the person you want to get to know. So how do you figure out who that person is? Well, you can start in the medical staff office or the residency office and just ask somebody, hey, who's the go-to person for doctors around here? Now, whenever you approach the den mother, always approach them in the spirit of service. Remember, if you want to do business with doctors, conduct yourself as one. Doctors are committed to service. So always approach in the spirit of service. And you say, you know, I know that you have a lot of doctors counting on you. This is a turbulent time. How may I help you help your doctors? And then figure out how you can solve the den mother's problem. Build a relationship with the den mother. And then talk about leverage. That den mother probably influences the choice of tens or even hundreds of doctors. That's a great relationship to invest in. Hope that answers your question, Colin. And I wish there were easier answers here. Um, next, um, Joe, let's see. Yeah, OK. I have an endorsement program for residence fellows of a large practice, but managing partner does not want to extend it to partners due to conflicts with other partners. Okay, so. Remember I said that doctors form trusting relationships? 
once a doctor has a relationship, they're really going to honor it. I mean, this he could have a relationship with his brother-in-law. You just really never know. So if you meet this kind of resistance, I recommend just stepping back. Go ahead and deliver the value. Deliver the yummy treats or hostess gifts or whatever you want to say. Because it may well be that through that, you will build a relationship. But just know that there are some doctors that you are just simply not, not going to reach. You know, if you think about a hostess, at a restaurant, going around with some coffee. She goes to each table, would you like coffee? Some say yes, some say no, some say, well, is it decaf? No, I don't want, you know, if, it, if it's not decaf. That's kind of like what it's like to approach doctors. Some are going to want it, some are not going to want it. If they don't, just go on to the next one and, and build on your successes. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Brian says, doctors are so busy. What's a good time to suggest for a meeting and where? My office, their office, breakfast. One of my advisors says, my doctor clients pay me lots of money. I'm going to go see them at their office and do everything I can to make it easy for them. So when you think about meeting with doctors, the first question is, with whom should you be meeting? Should you be meeting with the doctor, or maybe should you be meeting with the um, the doctor's husband or wife. One of my advisors is with Merrill Lynch. She's married to a radiologist. She told me about how frustrated she was. She can't get her husband interested in money. She said, he says, well, you're the money person. You're the one making choices. I said, you know, why are you, how about if you just connect with other doctor's wives who are just like you? And sometimes that's the best way to make a connection. So figure out who the right person is. And then this strategy of meeting doctors where they already gather is a really great choice. Doctors are really busy. They're really distracted. If they've already left the office and their beepers are off because they're at a medical meeting, that's a great place to catch them. So for example, I belong to Seattle Surgical. Once a month, we would have a dinner meeting. And um, maybe you could meet a doctor either before or after that dinner meeting. Or maybe even ask if you could be a guest at that meeting, and maybe the doctor could introduce you to his or her colleagues. Or maybe you could attend a meeting that is held in a resort community. Many doctors and many medical associations host these meetings at resort kinds of facilities that serve as both a family vacation and as a meeting. And you could maybe host a breakfast event outside of you know the formal meeting. So just rent a room and host your own private practice or uh, breakfast. So plan on just meeting them where they gather instead of trying to disrupt them. Next, Wayne asks, uh, and thank you for that question. My age is 73 and have had good success in the corporate market. Congratulations. Am I too old for the doctor market? Absolutely not. In fact, I think that there's a lot of doctors who would like people who have lots of experience. So let me offer another idea for you, Wayne. And that's that um, while I've talked about the medical market, I've been talking about you know clinicians, people who take care of patients. But there's a whole other part of the medical world, and those are the medical executives, the people who actually run the hospitals and clinics. These are business-minded people who generate very, very high incomes. Um, most CEOs of major hospitals and clinics are generating seven-figure incomes. Is there, would you feel more comfortable developing relationships with those executives or with the doctors? So that's for you to decide. But I think that in general, remember we talked about mirror neurons. I think that in general, the high performers work with people who are like them. There are lots of doctors in their 70s who are still practicing, who are thinking about retirement, or who have made the transition to retirement. Is there some way that you can add value to them? So I would really encourage you. One of my coaching clients who's actually the most innovative, his name is Tony Kenzier. He is the youngest at heart, and he is in his 70s. The technology that he embraces, he's amazing. So. Stay young. Try new things. Let me know if I can support you in any way. Um, let's see. Have I missed any questions here? Let's see. Um, the one, where were we at? 
about the CPA. Did we get to that one? Let's see. Thank you for sending that question, Brian. I have a CPA that is a new center of influence. By the way, I call them sender of influence, S-E-N-D-E-R. 80% um, of her practice is doctors. How do I capitalize on that relationship? What I would do if I were you is I would have a meeting with her and I would say, hey, I bet you would like to deliver more value to your prospects and clients. Is there any educational program that I could provide for you? Is there any information that I might be able to provide for you? So what you're doing is you're helping your CPA get what she wants to help you get what you want. So make it a win for her. Make it a win all around. And that's the best way of doing it. By the way, I just spoke with one of my coaching clients. He said he had been building a relationship with the CPA for three years, three years, and it finally paid off. So if it doesn't work right away, just keep on at it um, because those are great relationships. Other great people to contact are pharmaceutical sales reps, medical device reps, and anyone who sells anything to doctors, maybe it's a medical billing system, maybe it's a laundry, maybe it's medical supplies, contact, just get a medical publication that the doctors read, see who's advertising, and then approach them and see if that same strategy will work for you. See if there's a way of your adding value um, so that it's a win for everybody. And, you know, think about how much better use that is of your time, getting in front of a group of 30 or 60 or 100 doctors than um, trying to get past the gatekeeper and make an appointment with an individual doctor who will cancel. Um, Wayne, thank you for your thank you. I, I'm, I hope that you did find this helpful. You know, I... I'm on a personal mission. I'm, I'm really on a mission to alleviate this financial pain. So I want to thank all of you for your attention, for your participation. I want to thank the PLUS group for inviting me in. I am just so grateful. If you have any questions for me that I was not able to get to, if, if you would like any resource, please feel welcome to contact your local Plus group office, and they will have links to these promised um, resources, and they have ways of getting in touch with me. Um, so, any any last things that you might like me to touch upon, Tracy, before we draw this to a close? <laughs> yeah, there seems that there's a couple more questions, but I think that we can get to those people. We'll uh, look at them. We'll have a list. If we didn't get your question, we'll email you back. Is that is that okay? Because it looks like there may have been a couple more. We Absolutely, didn't. I'm okay. happy to stay on the line as long as you'd like. And in fact, let me go through these questions. But just know, <laughs> just know that I am happy to respond privately to a question because sometimes there's questions that you don't want to share publicly. So I'm happy to get back to you privately. So just contact your plus group office and have them send it to me. Also. If it's okay with you, Tracy, maybe you might be willing to share the answer to other questions with the whole group so Absolutely. that others can benefit because if one person asks the question, probably others do too. Okay, so let me go through some more of these questions. So contact what, me if, I just want to throw in, if you want to do that, it's, it's hard to send out to every all, um, all the people, but if you want to send me an email and ask to see the questions and the answers, please do Tracy at plusgroupus.com. I will have, a, have that. So, okay. okay, sorry for adding to your workload, Tracy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mark asks, what do you do when several doctor clients seem to be too busy to call you back for a review? All right, doctors are busy, but if something is important to them, they will be there. So what this is telling me, Mark, is if you're having a problem getting the attention to, of a doctor, it could be that you're offering them something that they need rather than something that they really want. So what I might recommend that you do is talk with other doctors who are in this tribe. Let's say you want to work with, uh, I, I'm picking on cardiologists today. Let's say you want to work with cardiologists. Maybe what you could do is get a hold of some kind of list of top doctors, not in your prospecting area, but directly outside, contacting them and saying, I'm wondering if I might be able to interview you. I want to serve the cardiologists who serve our community. 
And really, I want to understand your world. I want to be able to see the world through your eyes. Would you be willing to send 10 minutes on the phone with me? Um, I'd be happy to even get scheduled into your patient appointment book and compensate you for the time. What the experience with my advisors who try this is that cardiologists and any doctor are delighted to talk. Um, they do not ask to get compensated. And here's why. Very few people go to doctors and say, what's important to you? What are you thinking? In fact, one of the reasons they're so unhappy about the Affordable Care Act is nobody asked them and they don't like it. So um, you can just imagine how a doctor would feel if somebody approached them and said, what you think really matters to me? Could you please share it? And then in the Cracking the Doctor Code course, I've got a list of questions that you can ask. So basically what you want to do is ask the right questions so you're able to deliver the right message to the right doctor at the right time so that you're not going to go chasing doctors, but you're going to attract doctors to you. I remember when I got my puppy and I was training my puppy to come. You know, he didn't know what come meant. And so I would approach him, and whenever I approached him, he would just run off. It wasn't until I learned to stay still, issue the come command, and then have a yummy treat waiting for him that he got it. And that's exactly what you can do with your prospects. Have some yummy treats so you attract them to you rather than do the chasing. I hope that that helps. I also know many of these things are counterintuitive. It's just not, it's kind of like turning a jacket inside out. It's just, it's not the way you think of about it. Um, and it takes some getting used to. But what I can tell you is that this approach yields great results. OK. Thank you, Robin, for your kind comment. She appreciated the time and found value in this. I, I thank you. I'm, I'm humbled. And what I hope is that, that you express your gratitude by taking some action getting some results that you weren't able to get and letting me know and letting the rest of the community know. Because action is really, really important. Knowledge is one thing, but what I really want for you is for you to be able to achieve the kind of personal and professional and economic success that, that you reach. And I'm always opening to developing new information, new content, new resources to support your success. And I know that the PLUS group has that commitment too. Um, do you find that there's one subject that doctors really struggle planning for or procrastinating most with? Disability insurance, retirement plan options, getting the right insurance plan? Um, <clears throat> great question, Dan. And um, basically, it has anything to do with doctors. Like if you were at the grocery store and there were samples of cod liver oil and there were five different brands of cod liver oil, you would probably avoid all of them. And for many doctors, thinking about money, thinking about retirement planning is exactly like that. So you saw in that AMA insurance agency survey, over half of physicians are behind where they'd like to be in their financial, in their retirement preparedness. And I think what happens is they've got this aversion to thinking about money. They don't know how, whom to trust. And so they just ignore it. So if you can help doctors achieve some result that they do want, if you can help them avoid getting sued, or avoid embezzlement, or raise financially literate children, or get work-life balance, or figure out how to generate more revenue when the Medicare cuts unfold, or have a stronger marriage, if you can offer them something that they really want, then you're in a much better position to have their ear, have the trust that will enable you to take that next step. And probably probably the biggest reason that advisors struggle so much in the medical market is that they, they fail to understand this. They really fail to understand that for doctors, money is the taboo topic. So again, if I were to sit down with you and ask, Dan, could we talk about your bowel function? How many bowel movements do you have a day? And what about your sexuality? I mean, it would just, 
you would need a strong relationship before you do that. You need a strong relationship with a doctor before they're able to take that next step. Now, I'll tell you the one exception to this. It's doctors hate paying taxes. So if you could partner with some kind of CPA and figure out how to minimize their tax burden, that is one surefire way of grabbing their attention of most people, of most people. I can't promise 100%, but that really is something that they want. OK, Mark. There are existing clients that bought DI and now don't seem to want to be bothered after one to two years for review. So here's what I might do, Mark. Get a copy of that AMA insurance um, agency review. Um, get that video about 10 ways to leverage it. And, um, and, and just send it to them, thought that you might be interested in this, thought you might be interested to see how you compare with your colleagues. Doctors are so competitive. They always want to know where they stand in relationship with other colleagues. So that's a surefire way of grabbing their attention. Um, the other thing that you might want to do is if a member of the tribe that you're in, and generally tribes are 100 or 200 people, um, if somebody becomes disabled, use that as an opportunity to reach out to other members of the tribe. Because now you're telling a story. Now you have their interest. I, was, I saw primarily breast cancer patients. And I know that whenever a woman was diagnosed with breast cancer, all of her friends would go in and get mammograms, you know, the ones who hadn't been in for two or three years. So I'd always be on the lookout for uh, windows of opportunity. Um, sort of the, in summary, the, the bad news, if you want to master the medical market, is that you are offering your, your core value is something that doctors don't want to talk about. So it's kind of like trying to sell peanuts to somebody with a peanut allergy. So you've always got to be looking for creative, resourceful ways of making a connection so you can move to your core value proposition. And by the way, you're welcome to join um, conversations that I have on my targeting um, doctors group on LinkedIn. You know, there's lots of ways of kind of getting free stuff that I do, but all I'm regularly creating ideas that are solutions to these kinds of problems. Um, and um, thank you for your kind comment, Mark. I really appreciate that. Vince asks, any other topics doctors would like to know more about? Do you pamphlets, email, or any other means besides taxes? The answer is absolutely yes. So. When you think about your marketing, think about three kinds of marketing campaigns. One is relationship marketing, where you sit down with an individual and you build a relationship. The second is educational marketing. So you're offering high value educational content that helps the physician achieve a goal. And the third is community marketing. You position yourself as a community leader and form some kind of club. And doctors really like exclusive clubs. So. Um, you can think about your marketing strategy, like which kind of marketing campaign do you want to launch. In general, you probably have one that's most comfortable for you, that works best for you. So you probably want to focus in on that one, although you might want to think about two other campaigns. And then there's the actual content, like what are the topics? And I ran through some of those topics, how not to get sued, how to generate more revenue, how to, um, how to get the maximal value of your medical practice if you're going to sell it to a hospital or clinic, um, how to get new patients, um, how to have a strong marriage. And then, and this is really important, the value delivery vehicle, the way that you package this, you have a, a number of different choices, too. You could have a pamphlet. You could have an ebook. You could deliver a webinar, either a live webinar or send people a link. You could make your own videos. I, I run a mastermind group, and I just had Andy Malloy, who um, is a financial advisor and actor. He gave tips about how to create high-value educational content through video. I think that's really important because when somebody sees you on a video, they like get to know you and like you and trust you. So by the first meeting, you've already built trust. So you can do videos, you can do audio podcasts, you can 
be quoted in publications. You might want to be, you know, a guest contributor to the white coat investor. Um, so, so the three questions is what kind of marketing campaign, what's the content, and what's the content delivery vehicle. And you can you can mix it up and do what works for you. You know, if you love getting in front of a camera and you hate writing, you know, probably podcasts or videos are better for you. If you love writing, you know, maybe you want to think about having a blog or writing your own ebook. The other thing is um, you don't have to deliver all the value yourself. Invite a doctor in. Invite one of your own clients in to talk about something that's of interest to other people. I'm even happy to deliver a webinar for you. You know, you I can be available on Skype and you can project me onto a screen and I can remotely be there. So you don't have to deliver it. You're just the one who's delivering the value. Kind of like the president of an organization or of our country doesn't do everything him or herself. But they're the ones who offer the leadership to the organization and they they identify the resources and provide them. I could go I get so excited about this. I could go on all day. <laughs> no, it looks like you covered most of the questions. I did want to say again to those of you still on the line that you will receive this link. So the question and answer period, you will all be able to hear all those questions and answers. That'll be all part of the recording. So there's your answer to anything that has been addressed. You will be able to hear that again when you get the link, which should be by tomorrow. Again, if there's any other questions, oops, maybe some more coming in, um, you can contact me, Tracy O'Malley, Tracy at PlusGroupUS.com, or you can talk, contact Dr. Reckner, um, in, you know, directly or your Plus Group office. So there are options. If there, again, we're trying to, you know, Vic, you know, Vicky's doing a great job of covering as many questions as she can here. So there are other options if you don't feel we've addressed what you needed. But again, it will be anything that's been said has been recorded. And it uh, looks like there may be more coming in, Dr. Rector. <laughs> well, I, I love doing this. Happy to stay on. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> OK. Um, I am not seeing new questions. Oh, okay. Can you see one that I haven't uh, answered? No, I guess Tracy? not. It was just a comment. Um, <laughs> but you are a gift from God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's so oh, nice. I'm humble. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, I really am here in service. We really need you. I mean, I'm going to say it again. If you look around the world, the major source of pain right now is financial. There's even a medical condition called MAD, money anxiety disorder. When you help somebody achieve financial health, you're really contributing to the world. I mean, this this is a mission. This is really a call. You are an important person. And I just I just honor you. I know that financial advisors have had a bad time. Every time Bernie Madoff is on the news, you know, it's a hard time for you. But I really honor what you do. I honor your expertise. And I'm so grateful that I've had people in my own life who've helped me fill in my gaps in financial literacy. It's enabled me to um, serve other people in a bigger way. So, you know, I really honor what you're doing. I do see one. Uh, Mark wanted to know how they get the AMA report. How do they get the AMA report? Mm -hmm. um, well, Tracy, would would you like me to refer them to the um, Plus Group local office? Sure. Or would you like me to yeah. send them the link? Yeah, or? they can just go to their office. You're going to send me all the stuff we need, right? And then right. Uh, I will support it off to all the offices. So, And if you don't know who your Plus Group office is, feel free to contact me and I will uh, help you with that. Some people don't really know who who that is. So, um, and how can you see the session and see the slides, especially if listened on the phone? You will still have that opportunity to see the slides as well as hear all the audio. Yeah, we send it as a link, so um, that's you'll get a link to a site and it'll take you there and you get to see all the slides and hear all the audio. So uh, I know a couple of people have asked about that. And by the way, you do have a PDF of the slides. So if you mm -hmm. just want to, you know, listen on your iPhone and, you know, maybe print out the PDF, that's an option for you too. Yeah, if you want the PDF rather than the link, you'll need to contact me, um, Tracy at plusgroupus.com, or you can contact your local Plus Group office and they'll be able to get that over to you. So um, feel free to do that. And what do you think, Dr. Reckner? Are we, did we? Did you cover them all? <laughs> you did a lot. 
<laughs> Man. <laughs> You did an amazing job. Okay, we now so just take it. everyone who's still alive, just take a deep breath and just think, okay, what one thing did I hear today that want, I want to put into action? Just one thing. What one action is important? Because that one thing that you try today, that might be your four hundred thousand dollar idea. So just one small thing that you do differently can make a huge difference in the kind of result that you get. One of our partners already sent me a note and said the one line that he thought was worth everything today was physicians manage their wealth the way patients manage their health. He thought that was just such a, a great line, by the way. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Well, it's important to remember that because it's so easy to forget. I mean, you feel so comfortable with money and these kinds of discussions. If you can just kind of wake yourself up to that reality every time you talk to a doctor. Um, it, it will really help build rapport more rapidly and accelerate this whole sales process. Because once doctors know you get them, once anyone knows you get them, you know how much easier it is to, to persuade them and master the fine art of verbal persuasion so that you're able to actually influence doctors to make the kinds of choices that you want them to make. Well, oh, are there more? There we go, more. <laughs> Do young doctors feel more comfortable dealing with you via the net and online? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that. So there's a real generational shift in the way that physicians share information. So like, I'm a surgeon. Between cases, I used to go to the doctor's lounge, or the surgeon's lounge, and we used to talk. <laughs> you know, I used to talk with the other doctors. Um, a millennial is much more likely to take out their smartphone and be connected on social networks. So uh, they still form tribes, but the way that they connect with their tribal members is different. So the way that you market to retirees or boomers is probably going to be different than the way that you market to millennials. And during the research phase of your business building, you specifically want to ask doctors where they hang out, like how they connect with other doctors. There is um, a social network called Doximity. It's actually like the LinkedIn for doctors. It's built by the same people who built LinkedIn. And, you know, doctors are private. They don't want to get sued. They want to be able to have their own kind of private information. So if you know, for example, that you know, there's a whole tribe on Doximity, then maybe what you could do is develop some kind of high-value educational content that one of your clients is willing to share with their colleagues on a Doximity group. So, you know, that's a way of getting in front of them. If they are on some kind of public social media, definitely go on and eavesdrop. Find out what's important to them. That's a great way of figuring out what kind of value you want to offer. Because right there, they'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you what their source of pain is. And if you can be the person who comes in with the solution and helps them get just a little bit closer to their um, outcome that they desire, that's a great way of building a relationship. I really uh, appreciate that point and, and that question. Um, Okay, Tracy, it looks like they want to know how to contact you. You're so popular. Okay. Yeah, um, I just sent a note. It's Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y, at plusgroupus.com. So T-R-A-C-E-Y at P-L-U-S-G-R-O-U-P-U-S.com. And any questions, like I said, it's just, you know, probably easier to come to me. I'll make sure I get to Dr. Rackner or your local plus group, group office. We'll make sure we'll take care of anything because we realize there's a lot of interest and we greatly appreciate that. And what do you think? Do you think we're <laughs> at, a, at a break? <laughs> um, well, just to honor the participants' time, we're like 45, we've gone twice as long as they were expecting. <laughs> we, right. we should probably honor their time and thank them for coming. Exactly. And just know that we're here. This is not a one-time thing. We, yep. we are here to support you. Absolutely. And with this interest, I can see us doing another one, a <laughs> follow-up. So. Um, maybe you can send me a note if you'd love to have another 
uh, have uh, Dr. Reckner talk again, we can certainly do that. We're here to help. We're here to educate. And um, we really appreciate all of you being you know, online on, on the call today. And especially appreciate Dr. Reckner for such an interesting and a great topic. And I think it was just so well received. Plus Group appreciates everybody. Again, you will get this recording. You should have it by tomorrow. Um, it also will be on our website at www.plusgroupus.com, hopefully by end of day today. Um, again, feel free to contact me, your local Plus Group office. And again, we appreciate everybody's time today so much. OK. Any last words, Dr. Wagner? Thank you all. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a real privilege to have people's attention. I hope that you found value today. I, I hope that you found a, an idea or two that's really going to help you take your practice to the next level. And remember, lots of ways of helping you get there. Take a look at that course if you have any interest. The course is going to help you not just in the medical market, but I talk about some neuroscience, about the, the way people really make choices. So no matter what, market you're in. You're going to find information that, that's going to help you be more effective and, and get the kind of results that you want. Great. Again, thank you, everyone. And feel free to contact me or local Plus Group office with additional questions, comments, concerns. And Dr. Ragnar, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. My great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.